I wanted to uh, take the opportunity uh, today, uh, not only to present my work, but to reflect a little bit about what I've, been, I've done in the past, and perhaps to, to open, of course, possibilities for, for future collaboration with you, with people here, uh, but also to reflect myself about where I want to go or, or, or which path I can take in the, in the future. Um, so actually what I've done uh, for a good part of my, my uh, research career uh, is try to integrate uh, what's going on um, above ground yeah, uh, with risophore interaction. So uh, terrestrial ecosystems traditionally uh, have been considered uh, having two, two components, one above ground and one below ground. And uh, ecologists or researchers uh, used to focus on one of the, of the subsistence, let's say. But uh, this view is quite challenged in the, in, the, in the last years. And people is trying to develop now a much more holistic approach uh, and trying to integrate uh, these two systems. Huh? And during the last decade, uh, there's been quite some research linking this, uh, these two uh, uh, words, let's call it. And, um, and I will give first uh, an introduction of uh, the mechanisms driving these uh, indirect or direct interactions. And then on a later stage, I will give some examples from my research uh, where I have used this, uh, this framework. So one of the... Uh, uh, most important concepts uh, that have been developed during the last uh, years, uh, from the late 90s till now, is the concept of uh, plant soil feedback. Yeah? So it's a concept that is quite, quite simple, and uh, it, it means that plants uh, interact with uh, rhizosphere uh, organisms, and they select yeah, from this community of organisms uh, certain groups, and I mean selection in a, a ecological, uh, from an ecological point of view and not from an evolutionary point of view. And by selecting certain groups, they influence, they affect their own growth. And this selection, this filtering of organisms in the soil can be positive for some of these uh, plant species or can be negative. And then we talk about uh, positive or negative plant soil feedbacks. Um, so this is a concept that I, uh, uh, I use in, in quite some, uh, I've used in quite some uh, uh, experimental approaches that, I've, uh, that I will show uh, today. Of course, I go back to, to the slides, this, this selection not only affects uh, the plant community, but may have a cascading effect in other components of the system associated with plants above ground. So what are the, the mechanisms uh, linking this at plant level? What are the mechanisms at plant level linking these two uh, sub-communities or subsystems? I, I mean, I don't want to go into uh, molecular details, but um, the, the, the best way to, to, to illustrate what's uh, mediating this subsystem is uh, that rhizosphere interactions may affect either the primary metabolism of plant, eh, the quantity and the quality of nutrients that they have, or they may, they may affect uh, plant defenses. And by affecting this, either the primary metabolism or the secondary, having defensive compounds or inducing defenses, they affect other trophic levels above ground. So it's quite, quite simple. Um, and one of the things that still remains quite open is what's, what these interactions at rhizosphere level that affect groups occurring above ground, what's the meaning, of course, from a community, but also from an evolutionary point of view. So this is also another question that I have tried to, to, to use or to, to, that I have in the back of my mind while exploring these above-below ground interactions and these plant soil uh, feedbacks. So for all, in general, if I have to put a framework to, to my research, I try to tackle more or less the same question in different systems. Eh? 
what's important of soil biota for plant community structure and dynamics. And does soil biota play an important role in plant perimeter interactions from a community point of view, but also from an evolutionary point of view? What are the operating mechanisms? What I just mentioned in the, in the previous uh, slide. And what can we learn from these interactions? Eh? And this is relevant, of course, from our conservation and, uh, and in particular in restoration ecology. And I will show now some examples uh, dealing with these questions in different natural systems. So my first step, steps in research were, were taken, were taken uh, in coastal dunes and also coming to Doñana, even though this is not the, the reserve, this is the station, which is a different thing. But uh, I associate Doñana with coastal dunes for one reason or another. So I thought if I come here, I should say something uh, about uh, dunes. And actually, I, I spent quite some time working on coastal dunes. So the first part of my talk, I will focus on the Amophila in area system. This is a pioneer species that occurs uh, in coastal dunes. And um, it's present in whole Europe. Yeah, you have an Atlantic uh, superspecies and a Mediterranean. And here at the coast, you have a kind of transition area. There are some pictures from nice natural areas. And morphologically, you have some difference if you compare North uh, European dunes or Central, I mean, for the Atlantic, and, uh, and Mediterranean uh, coastal dunes. You see some difference, and you can see this some difference uh, at morphological levels. But one important uh, feature or one important process that uh, occurs with Amophila denaria is that there is a decrease in, in vigor in the growth after some years. So you have dominance. Okay? This plant is quite dominant in, in the dunes, but after a while, when the dune gets fixated, it starts to decrease, it loses uh, vigor. Mm -hmm. And some people have speculated about the, the, the factors driving this decrease, decrease in, 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 in fitness and in vigor. And some people postulated or, or, or thought that uh, a complex of soil pathogens, including uh, plant parasitic nematodes and fungi, could be uh, taking or having a, a role here. So for my PhD, actually, what I did uh, is to identify at the European coast all, I mean, the nematode community associated to this uh, Amophila plant. I won't torture you with the taxonomy of nematodes, but the, the idea is I found here some functional groups, some uh, plant parasitic nematodes associated to this plant, which is interesting because it was not uh, described, some new species, but of course finding a, a new nematode species is not a big deal. Eh? Um, but the important thing that I want to, to, to test is whether these nematodes could affect the, the growth of the plant. So I did some classical plant pathology work. So I just uh, exposed this uh, plant, different populations of, uh, of um, uh, marron grass of Amophila denaria to these nematodes and I could see that they affected plant growth so they had a negative effect on them. Also associated to these uh, grasses you have uh, muscular mycorrhizal fung fungi. I don't know if you, you know this group. These are a group of fungi that are so-called mutualistic, so the plants get uh, nutrients from the interaction. Uh, I mean, get uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and the and the fungi gets uh, uh, sugars, get uh, nutrients. And you have this, and they are also present in this system. So I also tried to to understand what was the role of these mycorrhizal fungi in the in the system. These are plant mutualists, and I thought perhaps they are helping the plant to cope with these uh, root herbivores, with these plant parasitic nematodes uh, at root level. So I did some uh, exper experiments just to, to test it, so full factorial experiments in which you expose the same plant to the nematodes, to the mycorrhiza, or combinations of uh, mycorrhiza and plant, and I compared nematode multiplication to see whether, depending on the presence of mycorrhiza or the absence, you have a different uh, population dynamics of, or, or, or growth. 
And I could see that the multiplication of nematodes, were, they were associated to the plant alone, I mean, without mycorrhiza, you have was quite high, but in the moment that you have mycorrhiza at, a, at root level, you have a decrease in multiplication. So these plants, I mean, these mycorrhiza were in a way protecting uh, the plant from these uh, vicious uh, nematodes. Right? And I worked on this system for, for, for my PhD, but I, I was going to the, to the dunes on a regular basis, and I always found, or I was interested in understanding what would happen with the insect community associated to these plants. And perhaps some of you are thinking there is nothing there. I mean, there is just uh, sand and it's a dry place. I mean, you probably have seen dunes around. So, but what is interesting is that. Uh, when you take a close look to the, to the system, you see that uh, above ground you have quite some uh, species of insects which are um, very specific and very characteristic of uh, these coastal, coastal dunes. And as I told you, at root level, you have also a complex of species driving this, uh, this system. So protecting the plants from these nematodes and the nematodes are involved in this die out. So if you think a little bit more uh, from a wider perspective, the thing is that the soil community affects the vegetation dynamics of this system. But associated to the plants, you have also insects. So are these communities affecting each other? Because they share the same, uh, the same host. But one of the problems it was that the communities associated to the, to the plant, to this uh, maran grass in coastal dunes, was not described. So we have seen some, some species, but I mean, people usually go to the beach just to enjoy uh, the view, or the, but they don't search for really li uh, little, uh, almost invisible uh, organisms. Eh? So the first thing that, uh, that uh, we did uh, was just to try to describe the community associated to this plant. So uh, I had a, a PhD student, Martin van der Gehoefte, and what we did is first quite some basic work describing the communities uh, of these uh, of, of, of coastal dunes in different, in different areas. And, and later on, we address experimentally whether these soil communities and these above ground insect communities could be affecting each other. And of course, we tackle this uh, experimentally. So we, again, use some uh, classical uh, experiments in which we had our plants, Amophila and aphids, and these plants were treated with nematodes or without nematodes, and we could see that if uh, the, the, the plants didn't have uh, nematodes, eh, the multiplication of the aphids associated to these plants was much higher. So there was something happening, they affect each other, but of course you might think, well, this is quite artificial, you have forced the system, you know, to just treat your plants. And so we wanted to see whether this happened also in, in the field, so we did uh, a field experiment, I will show you first the picture with really grown plants that we grew in the lab for, for, for one year and a half. And then we did a common garden experiment where we introduced plants. An interesting thing here, we introduced plants uh, to have a bit of variation and to have a representative um, idea of what was happening on a larger scale. We introduced plants uh, coming from from different geographical areas to have a, a common garden experiment. So we took plants from, from Southern Europe, and, uh, from the North Sea coast in Belgium and the Netherlands, and we brought them together to one place in Belgium where we did this common garden. And what we did is to monitor what was coming to these plants, to these plants, yeah? what was coming above ground. Yeah? So what type of organism of insects would colonize these different populations from southern and from, uh, 
from the North Sea coast. Hmm? So you have local and, and, and allopatric populations. What happened above ground and also in soil. So what would come to the roots of these, uh, of these plants? And you can see here, so you have here different populations, doesn't matter. You have from local populations, so the uh, sympatric combination of plants and, and, and the site. Um, populations coming from far away, so those are the Iberian populations from the coast of Portugal. And you can see for different insect groups that uh, they prefer or they multiply or they, uh, they, they are in, in larger numbers uh, with the local plants. So the, the sympatric combination of plants and the above ground community, I mean, there is a kind of a match there. You have a better performance there. But for the soil community, these are different nematode species, you don't have this pattern. And actually, if you look a, a little bit, you have a contrary response. So the soil community kind of perform better, better on plants coming from far away. So you have a, this, this difference in, in, in the performance. So putting this in a kind of a cartoon, if you have combinations of plants with the community, the local combinations, you have a, a, a better or, a, or, a, or a, a better performance when you have a local match above ground. But the far, the farther you go, the more distance you have, the above ground community, the insects perform much uh, worse. But the soil community does much better. So you have this this kind of contrary uh, or, or, or pattern. And this is quite, I think it's quite interesting. I'm still puzzled with this uh, result. But I didn't know, or one of the questions I want to, is this just a matter of sequential co colonization? So, of course, the dispersal of this species is different. You would expect it, that uh, insects move much faster than nematodes occurring in a rhizosphere level. So perhaps what I was seeing here is just an effect of differential splitting colonization of the plants, depending on the population. So I did another uh, test to see whether this was related with local adaptation or with time of colonization. Yeah. The, so this is also a, a classical experiment in which I have uh, a sympatric combination of uh, aphids and plants for different sites. So this is plants from one site with their own plants. Um, and then I, I, I treated this plant with either a local soil community, yeah, the sympatric combination, so you have all elements coming from the same site, or from a different area. And I count the performance of aphids in these plants with the local community or with the allopatric community. And you can see that the performance of the aphids is consistently better when they are, uh, when plants are grown with the local community. So probably there is a kind of uh, local adaptation, not only of the plant to the rhizosphere conditions, but also to the, uh, of the of the aphid, of the herbivore above ground. And of course, you could say, well, perhaps plants grow better, and this is related to, to, to the biomass of the plants. But actually, there are no difference. So probably there is a mechanism at plant level that is driving these uh, responses. And with this. Um, what can I get? I mean, going back to the questions that I posed at the beginning, what does this mean for the system? Mm -hmm. So that the above and below ground uh, community are actually linked by the plant community or by the plant, as we saw in this system. And these interactions indeed matter in this new system from a community and evolutionary uh, point of view. And for this system, what does it matter? Or what, what it, why is it important to understand this? So probably, as you know, revegetation of coastal dunes is quite often. It, it occurs uh, 
quite often. So depending on the type of vegetation that you introduce, you might have effects not only on the community that you see, but below ground. And this can, be, this can go in different ways. So you, you have to take into account this, these effects when you introduce uh, plant material, plant populations in a, in a system. Because it might affect how the system develops later on. And I don't know, probably many of you, I, I'm going to change now the system. This is a, or you have some Americans here, this is a European cartoon, Asterix and Obelix. I'm a, 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 a kid from the 70s and from the 80s, and you have this, this cartoon of Asterix and Obelix. Where La Residencia de los Dioses, eh? so that's a, the title in Spanish where they decide to pull out trees from, from, from a forest around a, an area, and then you have Panoramics, which is the magician of the, that develops these uh, treated acorns. They grow fast, and, 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 and I was fascinated with this uh, cartoon when, as a kid, but actually I've been fascinated as a, as a biologist with restoration ecology. How can we restore systems that are damaging. Unfortunately, we don't have yet this type of, uh, of treatments, but we can do research to try to improve restoration uh, strategies. And for a couple of uh, postdoctoral periods, I've, be, I've been trying to understand how changes, how agricultural uh, land use in the past affect the, our communities nowadays and can, how can we restore them. And I will give, in the coming 10 minutes, a couple of um, examples with this, with this framework. Yeah. And the first uh, uh, project I got as a, as a postdoc, and I worked for, 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 for some time, uh, was with Kaluna uh, with uh, Bulgaris, with uh, Heather, which is a dominant species in uh, Atlantic sheeplands. Yeah. So dominates all these uh, Atlantic, almost boreal uh, coast. And you can see this species dominating these uh, heaths with these very pink flowers that flower, uh, that flower at the end of the, of the season. And what is interesting uh, from this system is uh, that the plants and also within the framework of below above ground interaction, is that this plant depends on pollinators above ground for, 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 for vigorous growth and, and uh, stable populations. But also below ground depends on agricultural mycorrhiza. Again, one symbiosis between uh, the plants and the fungi that is essential for the plant to uh, acquire uh, nutrients. And many of these heathlands. Uh, are currently uh, restored, so they were they used to be agricultural uh, land, and now in Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, they are trying to restore these uh, these heaths. So they do different uh, procedures at soil level, and I wanted to see whether, depending off of previous land use and restoration strategy, whether this would have an effect on the performance of of, of these plants. And in particular, I wanted to know whether the interaction between this plant, between Caluna vulgaris, and the pollinators could be driven by soil conditions. So again, I, I, I used a common garden approach. So I took the same plant, but grown in soil coming from, from a, a healthy, mature uh, heathland, from a degrading uh, heathland with a lot of grasses where the plant was not doing very well, and from places where they were being restored and put them in the same uh, uh, context, okay? in, the same, in a common garden, and then look at the interaction between plants and different groups of uh, pollinators. And what I could see uh, is that depending on the type of soil, the phenology of your plants okay, would change. So when uh, these plants flower and how many flowers they get depends on uh, soil conditions. And this, was, this would affect 
the interaction with pollinators. So in actual here is only with uh, with the with the uh, domestic uh, bee. I try other groups, but I use the the bee here, the domestic, to illustrate what happened. And you can see that depending on the phenology, the type of visits change or the frequency of those visits uh, change. They prefer plants growing in this healthy reference uh, soil. And what what was driving the system? So as I said, I was look. I, I looked. I decided to look at soil level to mycorrhizal fungi, and I could see that uh, in reference soils, in these healthy soils, you have higher percentage of uh, colonization to the plants, and this would affect uh, what's going on uh, in the system. No? And with the results of this project, we, I think, were promising and interesting, and already working in, in, in a system a little bit more complex. The last uh, three years, or the last four years, before coming to, to Malaga, I've been working in a pro among other things, a project related with uh, woodland restoration. So in North Europe, but also at here in, in, in the peninsula, you have natural ancient forests, yeah? forests that have been used or, or are forests since probably at least in Europe, the Middle Age, okay? so for three, four centuries. And you have areas where we have uh, wood, we have forests, but they are growing in uh, areas where we have had agriculture on a previous. And you can see that the understory community is quite different. So in this natural ancient uh, woodland, you have a very characteristic understory. And in post-agricultural woodlands, you have um, yeah, quite rural community. So what happens here? What happens in soil level? What's driving this? So I come here. So these are just an example of the forest. So this is, these are uh, photos of an atlas from the 18th century, where you have some forest. Uh, and this is a Google Earth, uh, Google Earth uh, picture. And, and so I selected some forest sites in Belgium where we have a record of uh, land use and that we know that have been forest for a while and compare this uh, post agriculture with this ancient, uh, with these ancient uh, sites. And again, with this framework okay, in mind. And I go back again to this plant soil feedback uh, concept. What I thought, or my, my working hypothesis, is that changes at soil level, both in biotic and abiotic conditions, could affect plant growth and interaction with trophic groups uh, above ground. And in the particular case of post agricultural forest, probably the typical beautiful Woodland, indica woodland indicators, these typical understory species, don't, don't occur there because the bio biotic community is kind of limiting their establishment. Hmm? And this was to kind of uh, complement our current view of the system. So uh, if you go to, to the li literature, you will find that everybody thought that this differential composition in the communities has to do with dispersal limitation. So once the plants are gone by agriculture and you put back a forest, you have a you don't get the species there. But even after assisted in introduction we could see that the plants didn't establish so probably there was something else. And that's why I decided to look at these plant soil uh, interactions and um, these below above ground uh, interactions. So I compared, of course, just to prove the case, the communities in this system, and you can see that at plot level, we have this uh, ordination, that the composition in terms of um, flowers or, or, or the species present in the system was really different. Um, and, and then, I did some comparisons at plant level of, of, of the properties of these species, and I could see that 
the nutrients in these plants and at plot level would uh, differ very much, depending on whether you have had previously agriculture or not. So I also wonder what could, how could this affect the, the system. So I came across some old papers from the 80s from, uh, from White, who's a researcher who kind of posed uh, this nitrogen hypothesis that nitrogen and phosphorus are limiting factors in insect development. So probably herbivorous insects tend to feed and select plants with high uh, nutrient content of nitrogen and, and, and phosphorus. So I thought perhaps, as I said, the community is limiting this uh, this, this uh, the, establishment, the establishment of this uh, plant species. But to check this or to, to prove this, I had to compare first whether the communities uh, were differing. I mean, the, the, the insect community were the same or not. And if you compare the communities, are actually the same. I mean, the insect community. So probably there is something. So it's not that you have differential com different communities, it's you have the same communities, but there is something that makes these plants, uh, that limits the establishment. And I thought perhaps it's related with this condition where plants have more, plants growing in post-agricultural uh, woodland parcels. Uh, perhaps this is driving the, the system. Eh? So I did this introduction experiment. I introduced plants in post-agricultural soil, grow them. I could see that they, they, they had more nutrients, that they took uh, more nitrogen and phosphorus from soil. And that herbivory on, this, uh, on these plants was much higher. So uh, plants in this post-agricultural uh, forest uh, were eaten much more, you know, uh, much more frequent way, eh? more frequently. So you see some, so the white bars are these post-agricultural woodlands, and you can see that for different species, eh, you have consistently more uh, feeding. And also if you look at how much they are eaten, you can see them by just measuring. Again, you can see the different species are eating more. So actually they, they can, they, these plants are become very tasty for the insect uh, community here. So and I want to come to, uh, to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does this, what do the results from, from, from my work in heathlands and, and in, um, in woodlands have in common? So again, I think you can see here that the, the past influence in, um, or previous land use influence uh, the soil community, but also the abiotic conditions in soil. And that has cascading effects, uh, not only on plant growth and plant performance, but also on other trophic, uh, trophic levels. And these interactions, as I said at the beginning, could be driven, driven uh, by the biotic community, as in heathlands, where the ericot mycorrhiza were the driving factor on the system. But in these woodlands, probably abiotic feedbacks, what is going, uh, the nutrients in soil are driving this system. So depending, so the clue here is depending on the uh, system we are working, we can, we can have a different uh, mechanism linking this, uh, this system. And I want to take a couple of minutes to have some uh, final closing remarks, some, some thoughts. Uh, we tend to think of the soil as a unity, something that is there, but you can imagine, and here I, I, I show some, some modeling work I did, that you have differences in, in degrees of patchiness and aggregation at soil level for different soil organisms. So if you have a community, and here I, I just model a very simple community with, uh, with a plant and a grasshopper, and uh, depending on what's in the soil, the, the system can evolve in different ways. And these are 
this is a, a, a concept or a view that we should take, I think, in ecological uh, studies much more uh, into account. Um, also, from, from this study and looking at all these interactions, you have the plant community above ground, you have different functional groups, but you also have uh, at soil level uh, different uh, groups acting at different scales. So, one thing that is still puzzles me is at what scale should we study systems? Eh? Should we stay at rhizosphere level? Should we? And I, of course, I don't have the answer for this, but, uh, but that's something that we should. Uh, and perhaps what we have is what is called, in, I think, in English, or, or the Drost effect. Or, so this is what you see sometimes in a computer, in a mirror, that you have this uh, a system that is an image of itself many times. So when I think about soil and what is going on above ground, I see this inverted pyramid okay, where you have the same image okay, at both uh, levels. I don't know if I explain myself what I want to say. This is too philosophical. I think I'm going off a bit. But uh, I don't know. I wanted to tell you these things. And with this, I, I want to close uh, my talk. I've now, I'm now in, uh, in Malaga, in a small research station, La Mayora, that is focused on uh, tropical agriculture, actually. And I came here to start uh, a, a, a group in agroentomology or agroecology uh, focus on Mediterranean and subtropical subsystem, I mean, subtropical system, and focus on multitrophic interactions. And of course, I want to apply this above below ground uh, framework, having in, into account landscape uh, structure. And one of the things I found coming back to Spain is that natural, I mean, people working on ecology and People working in agriculture are really at two different leagues, let's say, or different. Uh, and I think these are a bit artificial. I think we should try to converge to merge system, to merge views. So I'm, even though I'm in Malaga, in agricultural research center, center I'm open for collaboration with, uh, with anybody who is interested in what I'm doing or the system I'm working with. And with this, I think many people that helped me to gather all this data and fun um, and of course I thank you for your attention. Um. <laughs>